Well, good morning. Welcome. This is Morning Mail for Wednesday, the 18th of May, 2022. Certainly good to be with you today. Trust you had a good day so far. Let's start with a prayer, and then we'll get right back into uh, the beginning of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's bow. Loving Father, thank you so much for the day and its blessings for the past night's rest, for your watching over and being with us. Thank you for this opportunity again uh, this weekday morning that we can come together in morning mail to look into your word, the message that you have sent to us as your spirit inspired men to write down your words that lead and guide us in this world of darkness. Bless us as we look today as we open your word. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning on Morning Mail, we are considering one of Paul's more striking texts on apostasy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. On Monday and Tuesday, we looked at a glorious passage, 1 Timothy 3, 16. And we would like to linger in the sunshine of that verse, but we must acknowledge that Even as there is soul-warming light, there is spirit-chilling darkness. Not only must we learn about the mystery of godliness, verse 16 of chapter 3, but we must also face the mystery of ungodliness, what Paul called the mystery of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Throughout the history of the Lord's church, there have been and always will be days of darkness. Paul talked about those days in our text. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Our text begins with the uh, adversative conjunction, but. This indicates that the first part of chapter 4 ties in with the last part of chapter 3, and that Paul was about to make a contrast. This contrast is between the wondrous truths of 316 and the perverted doctrines of the false teachers. Now, the topic of dark days is introduced with these words, but the Spirit explicitly says... This was not Paul's personal conclusion, but rather a revelation from the Spirit. Explicitly says. Now that word explicitly is from a Greek word identifying that which is precisely so. Now we cannot be sure what occasion was in Paul's mind when when he wrote the Spirit explicitly says. Perhaps he was thinking of the Spirit-inspired predictions given by Jesus and others. Maybe he was recalling a specific revelation from the Spirit. Whatever or whenever it was given, the Holy Spirit had left no question on the matter. There would be a falling away. Now, when would this apostasy come? The Spirit said that, quote, in later times some would fall away. The Greek word translated 
later here in the New American Standard can be translated latter, as in the New King James Version. The phrase latter times is associated with the Christian era. Later times makes us think of something that is not precisely happening but will happen in the future, perhaps far in the future. Now, while these verses could apply to any time in the future from the time that Paul wrote, Paul saw an immediate problem. Although he started with the future tense in verse 1, some will fall away, he shifted to the present tense in verse 3, men who forbid marriage. When Paul mentioned the apostasy in his second letter to Timothy, he also used the present tense. Chapter 3, verse 6 of 2 Timothy, For among them, the false teachers, are those who. The language may suggest that the situation would worsen in the future. But Paul's pressing concern was false teachers who were already present in Ephesus. A.T. Robinson, Robertson uh, suggested that the Spirit's prediction was, quote, now coming true, end quote, that Paul had in mind, quote, a present danger, end quote. That's from War Robertson's Word Pictures in the New Testament, Volume 4, the Epistles of Paul, page 578. From the inception of the Lord's Church, there have always been individuals who fall away. This was true in the past. It is true in the present. It will be true in the future. Apostasy is always a present danger. So what was the Spirit's prediction here in 1 Timothy 4.1? Some will fall away from the truth or excuse me, from the faith, end quote. Now the word translated will fall away is a term which means apostatize or abandon. It is a combination of two Greek words, one meaning away from and the other stand. So literally together they mean stand away from. It's also in the middle voice indicating this action was something the apostates did to themselves, not something that was done to them. Now the faith that the Spirit refers to is the body of teaching centered on Jesus. In order to have a falling away, there had to be something from which to fall away. Now, we noted some highlights of the faith in 316. However, as we shall see, the body of teaching also included instructions regarding such down-to-earth matters as food and marriage. We call this body of teaching the New Testament of Christ. To depart from the fundamental truths in the New Testament is to, as Paul described it back in the end of chapter 1, suffer shipwreck in regard to one's faith. See 1 Timothy 1 verses 19 and 20. Now how would this happen? In his prediction, the Spirit mentions several factors which would contribute to their apostasy. Specifically, quote, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, end quote. Now, first was a deplorable distraction. Those who fell away started paying attention to the false teaching. Paying attention to is from a Greek word which, as used in this verse, is to occupy oneself with, devote oneself to. In the previous chapter, the word was translated addicted, chapter 3, verse 8. Those who fell away were 
fascinated by the fanciful theories of the false teachers. They were distracted from the simple truths of the gospel. See 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. We're reminded of a small child who is easily distracted. His mother may be speaking to him words of wisdom, but his attention can be drawn away by the fluttery flight of a butterfly. Second was deliberate deception. Those who apostatize paid attention to deceitful spirits. The false teachers are described in the next verse, but behind them were deceitful spirits and demons. In Paul's earlier letter to the Christians in Ephesus, he noted that, quote, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in quote, Ephesians 6, verse 12. These spirits and demons are agents of our arch enemy, Satan. They are sometimes called angels, are messengers of Satan. See Revelation 12, verse 9. Satan is the tempter. First, see 1 First Corinthians 7, verse 5. In order to tempt us, he deceives and seduces us. He makes truth look like fiction and virtue, virtue appear old-fashioned and narrow-minded. He makes error seem credible and makes ungodliness alluring. His tactics are as old as time. See Galatians 3 verses 1 to 6 and 1 John 2 16. They achieve their purpose in the first century and they are still effective today. The third factor was demonic doctrines. Being deceived, the apostates began, as the English Standard Version says, quote, devoting themselves to teachings of demons, end quote. Now, the word demon there is a transliteration of the Greek word daemon. Error may sometimes seem inconsequential to us, perhaps even harmless, but it troubled Paul deeply. It is not just erroneous teaching, it is demonic teaching. Abraham, quote, entertained angels unawares, end quote, Hebrews 13, 2, the King James Version. See Genesis 18, verses 1 to 8. Those who embrace religious error entertain demons unawares. Satan can make error extremely attractive. To those easily exhausted, he offers an easier way. To the impatient, he offers immediate rewards. To those impressed by men, he offers scholarly pronouncements. To those who seek prestige, he offers insights available only to a select few. In whatever forms he presents erroneous teachings, they remain doctrines of demons, teachings with enough truth to make them plausible, but enough falsehood to send believers to hell. Well, that brings us to those whom the evil spirits use to spread their erroneous teaching. Verse 2 begins with the words, by means of, New American Standard. The New International Version has such teachings come through, and then describes the false teachers. The error may come from demons, but it comes through men. Verse 2 list several characteristics of these false teachers, and we'll look at verses 2 through 5 tomorrow. Let's close our time this morning with prayer. 
Gracious and loving Father, again, we're grateful for your blessings, for the word of, that you've given to us, the inspired word that's come from you. And Father, I pray that as we open our Bibles to every day and all through the day, perhaps, that we'll seek to listen to you speak through your spirit, through the men who wrote down these words. It will not listen to doctrines of demons. It will not listen to seducing spirits but rather only to the pure, simple gospel that you've revealed in the pages of the Bible. Thank you for it. Father, be with our world and bless us. Be with those in Ukraine, in particular as the war continues. Be with our country as turmoil and unrest continues. There's, there's been more shootings and, and senseless actions on the part of a few. And I just pray, Father, that we can take your word, the simplistic, pure light of your word, and shine it into the darkness of our world. Thank you for Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Well, you go have a great Wednesday. Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for more Morning Mail.